Very cordial greetings to everyone from the Pan American Health Organization. I want to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because we know people are logged in from many parts of the world. I'm Pedro Ordunez, and I'm the Regional Advisor in the Department of Non-Communicable Diseases and Mental Health at PAHO headquarters in Washington, DC. And here we are launching a new webinar on the HEARTS program. I wish to extend uh, greetings to our community of HEARTS countries. We know 12 countries are, are implementing the HEARTS initiative in their countries. And I just want to compliment those first countries. We have 12 countries. The first four were Barbados, Cuba, Colombia, and Chile. The second group of countries included Ecuador, Argentina, the Dominican Republic, and Trinidad and Tobago. And we also have St. Lucia, I, excuse me for just a moment. I first need to give the floor to Yeni Rodriguez, who is going to uh, give some brief instructions. Good morning, Jenny. Yes, good morning. We're now going to start this virtual seminar on cardiovascular disease and COVID-19, interrelationship and opportunities for change of two global crises. Thank you everyone for your attendance and punctuality. We have some very important technical uh, issues to be aware of during this session. We have simultaneous interpretation available in English and Spanish. Over this platform, you can find the interpretation button and the toolbar at the bottom of your screen towards the right, which will activate when you move your cursor over it. Then you will select interpretation. You can click this option and select the language you wish to listen to. And you will speak the uh, if you do not want to hear the original uh, language of the speaker, click mute original audio. And we also would like to ask all panelists, uh, if you have a question for the panelists, to use the Q and A button on the middle bottom part of your Zoom screen. And when you're not speaking, please keep your microphones on mute. And if you forget to turn it on, the host can turn on your microphone for you. We're going to go through the presentations according to our agenda. And I give the floor back to Pedro Ordunez, who is the Re Regional Advisor for Non-Communicable Diseases at PAHO WDC, Washington, DC. Thank you. Yes, as I was saying, as we're, we're launching this HEARTS webinar, and it's a very emotional moment, but when you go into the Zoom room and you see how many participants are there, we now have 265 participants and the number keeps going up. So in addition to extending greetings to you from PAHO, I'd like to take the opportunity that you are with us. If you know people who have not yet connected, please send them an email or a text to let them know that we are live with our webinar and today we are going to be discussing a very essential and current type uh, topic, which is cardiovascular disease and COVID-19, the interrelationship between these two global crises. That is cardiovascular disease and the COVID-19 crisis. We are trying to identify the opportunities for change offered by this very dramatic and complicated moment in our history that everyone is experiencing. My first thought, as always, for those who may have lost a relative or friend or loved one to over these terrible months of the COVID-19 pandemic, I would also like to remind everyone who has been impacted by the pandemic in some way or another, which has been true of so many parts of the world, and it has been such a dramatic, serious pandemic, and we continue to watch it because it's very important, and we always recall our colleagues who are on the front lines caring for serious uh, cases of illness, but we also remember everyone who is providing cardiovascular uh, care and health care in general. So today, as always, we have a very impressive roster of participants and speakers. 
uh, top rate speakers, I just want to remind you of the program that we're going to present today. First of all, we will have a session on cardiovascular disease and COVID-19, the interrelationship and common approaches for these two condi conditions. For this purpose, we have a very illustrious panel, uh, starting with our dear friend, Donald DiPetti, whom we all know very well because Donald has been a key person helping the countries of our region to develop treatment protocols that work and are practical and are evidence-based. We are also today going to hear from Professor Daniel Lackland, another important advisor for us. He is the past president of the World Hypertension League, and he's a fervent believer in the fact that we need to move forward in tackling cardiovascular disease. Another colleague we're going to hear from today who is also a heart advisor who's going to talk about innovations in cardiovascular disease is Professor Kenneth Connell from Barbados, who is another one of our advisors. And that first panel that's going to start in just a moment is going to talk about the lessons learned from the interplay between cardiovascular disease and hypertension care and the common elements uh, between the two. Then our second session will be the late breaking journal club headlines. And we're going to look at some very recent publications. And then I will give you uh, links for these, but we have two important uh, refereed journal articles. And uh, we're going to hear about how this applies to a PAHO publication. The first module of pub, uh, publication uh, will be commented upon by Dr. Jamar Dioskit, who is also collaborating with us. He's one of the initiators of the Hearts Project in Barbados. He's now doing his residence in cardiology. And Jamario is going to tell us about the implications of these publications. And we're also pleased to have a PAHO colleague with us, Dr. Ludwig Reves, who is going to comment on the most recent PAHO publication related to um, an assessment of therapeutic potential for COVID-19 treatment. So we will now immediately uh, go back to Professor Donald DiPetti, who is a distinguished professor at the University of South Carolina and University of South Carolina School of Medicine and Columbia, South Carolina in the United States. So we welcome you, uh, Professor DiPetti. You have the microphone and we look forward to your presentation. And please tell your friends that our webinar is live now. We have over 300 participants. Professor DiPetti, you have the floor. Professor DePetti, you have the floor. Are you there? There we go. Okay. Can, can everybody hear me? Pedro, can you? Uh, Pedro, thank you very much for that uh, kind uh, introduction. It was, it was too generous. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to give the overview to really uh, the goal uh, of this presentation is to try to you know, do a synopsis of why we're here, where we're, where we're going, and obviously to put the, the webinar together. Uh, Gloria, next slide, please. This slide really, I think, is, is important to tell us why we're here today and why this, uh, this webinar is so important. And that is the, the tremendous and deleterious interrelationship between what I'm gonna call the acute COVID-19 pandemic and the chronic non-communicable disease pandemic. And when you put these two together, it really is a perfect storm of morbidity, mortality. <clears throat> and of course, uh, devastation, not, not only uh, in disease, of course, and, and family burden and personal burden, but economic burden and hardship. 
Let's start with the acute COVID pandemic on the top of the slide. This unfortunately, as we're gonna see in much more detail has led to an interruption of NCD management. And ever, wherever for the purposes today, we see NCD management, you could put hypertension or any disease uh, that you wish uh, in, the, in the NCD community, uh, community on uh, to this slide. The interruption of services has led to increasing the chronic NCD pandemic which unfortunately leads to increasing the morbidity and mortality of NCDs. That would be bad enough if that didn't increase the comorbid diseases with COVID-19, leading to increased COVID-19 morbidity and mortality and further worsening the acute COVID pandemic. That is why we're here this morning or wherever uh, you, the, the participants are during the day. Next slide. Well, again, why hypertension? Well, number one, as again, we're gonna see in much more detail, hypertension is a major, if not the leading comorbid risk factor for COVID-19, but also we all know, and we're here today because we know that the control rates of hypertension in low, middle, and as you're gonna see, even high income countries is really, uh, really pathetic, if you will, and needs continuous improvement. Next slide. I know most of us are, we're, are discussing low and middle income countries, but I just wanna share with you this recent publication from the United States. The NHANES data, which is our US population-based data, has really sounded an alarm and a call for action. Through the decades of increasing hypertension control, we were doing reasonably well, as recently as about 50 to 60% control rates. Unfortunately, something has dramatically changed. And the last report in 2017 and 2018, we've now seen a significant and sudden decrease in hypertension control rates to the low 40%. If we apply the newer ACC AHA criteria, the control rate again in the United States would be as low as 19%. This also parallels the recent increase in CVD related morbidity and mortality. And that is the call to action that has sounded the alarm. Again, even in high income countries. Next slide. This led to just this month, the United States Surgeon General's call to action to control hypertension report. This report has three overall goals. Goal number one is to make hypertension control a national priority. Goal number two is to disseminate the importance of hypertension where people live learn, work, and play to increase the control rate of hypertension. And really pertinent to this webinar, the third goal is to op optimize patient care for hypertension control. And the very first strategy of this goal, strategy A, was to advance the use of standardized treatment approaches and guideline recommended care, including, as we're gonna discuss, hypertension formularies and treatment protocols or algorithms. Next slide. So it appears that what we've been doing has worked somewhat and now is even, has even leveled off and or decreasing hypertension control rates. And I think that probably calls for a different approach. We started when there was no pharmacologic management for hypertension or even the knowledge that hypertension should be treated with no care. That quickly when pharmacologic agents became available morphed to step care approach. That then gave way to individualized care where we, most of us are, are living today. And I believe now the call is to move to a population-based care approach as we're gonna discuss. Next slide. Well, there are many elements in a overall population-based or public health care, primary care health, if you will, uh, to, the, to, to the delivery of care to increase hypertension control. But even more important is the implications in the COVID-19 pandemic. And I highlighted the one that we're gonna be addressing this morning, and that is medications. This is what I'm gonna be talking about, which is standardized, broadly available, integrated into small comprehensive formularies and present a straightforward treatment approach in the form of, an, of a protocol or an algorithm. Next slide. There are many barriers to hypertension control. However, a standardized formulary and treatment protocol does attack some of these barriers very specifically, such as a patient barrier, 
of poor adherence to treatment, a healthcare provider barrier or barriers of therapeutic inertia, and lack of adherence to treatment guidelines, even though treatment guidelines are available, and health system barriers such as relationships to supply or distribution and cost, as well as the complex medical regimens that exist today. Next slide. Well, there are three classes that we can choose from by, by most, if not all now, hypertension guidelines. The diuretics, the renin angiotensin system uh, inhibitors such as ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and the calcium channel blockers. Next slide. I leave beta blockers in here with just the reminder that they should be left as for compelling other indications of the individual patient's care, not for the primary treatment of hypertension. Next slide. Well, what are the ideal characteristics of an individual medication if we were going to choose one? And they are summarized in this slide. Of course, they have to be safe and efficacious and well-tolerated. They have to be supported by evidence base, as Dr. Adunas has already mentioned, and they have to be affordable, and more importantly, they have to be available. It would be very nice if ideally they had daily dosing for adherence and ease, and also if they came in a score tablet, which might then permit pill splitting. Next slide. However, I think we are now moving beyond the individual initial treatment of hypertension with a single agent. That, that would be the individualized treatment, if you will, to now looking at the advantages of initial combination pharmacologic therapy. And there are many advantages seen in this slide, the most important of which is if we start with the end in mind, which is increasing hypertension control, most individuals, even in the primary care setting, will need two or more antihypertensive agents. So, not, so why not start with more than one initially? There's greater efficacy, which will improve blood pressure control. You use less doses of two medications, so you would reduce side effects. It's a simplified treatment regimen for better adherence. It reduces clinical inertia. And when complementary classes of agents are chosen, and I think this is a really important advantage, especially when we're talking about geographic, regional, and global hypertension control. When you use two complementary classes together, you lower blood pressure equally across very diverse demographic groups. And of course, there may be economic benefits long-term, despite the initial increase short-term for pharmacologic costs. Next slide. Well, that in mind, if we're gonna start with two medications, what are the ideal characteristics of combination medications that we could choose? And again, they're very similar to the same ideal characteristics of the individual agents themselves with a, with a significant expansion. Number one, again, they must be highly efficacious. They must have adequate additive or synergistic blood pressure reduction. Again, evidence-based. They should mitigate each other's side effects. That would be ideal. And we know that there are certain combinations that do that. They have, the, they have to have the potential for wide availability and affordability. Again, safe and effective across diverse demographic settings. And again, daily dosing, and perhaps even in a, in, a, in a scored tablet, if you will. Next slide. So with that in mind, which two classes? A group of us uh, convened again by, by Dr. Dunas and Paho. Con eso en mente. Published this paper in the JCH, which recommended two classes of agents. The preferred two classes was a renin angiotensin inhibitor in combination with a calcium channel blocker. Acceptable combinations would be the RAS inhibitor, either an angiotensin receptor blocker or angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor with a thiazide or thiazide-like diuretic. We chose at the time to list a CCB and diuretic combination as not preferred, predominantly because of less evidence-based medicine. Next slide. So once that has been chosen, what is the process? Select a preferred and acceptable pharmacologic drug class. Select preferred and acceptable pharmacologic agents within each class. 
and then select which preferred and acceptable combinations are available and affordable. Next slide. And this can be done in a staged approach as Dr. Skeeth is going to more fully uh, review this, the paper which this comes from. Clearly start with the end in mind. There must be a current protocol that it could be immediately put in place. Even at the same time, we can be moving towards an acceptable protocol and then per perhaps even the preferred protocol, again, even if that's 12 or 18 months down the road, we have to start today. Next slide. So in summary, a standardized formulary and pharmacologic treatment protocol is more important than ever in the COVID-19 pandemic. We must use a standardized and simplified approach to hypertension control. We must use a small and specific medication formulary that is primary care based. Also, that formulary should be put into a straightforward pharmacologic treatment protocol that uses half maximal doses of two medications initially, better yet, even in a fixed dose or single pill combination. And finally, we can take a stepwise approach to protocol development. We can have a present protocol while we're aspiring to have an acceptable protocol. And then of course, ultimately a preferred protocol if needed. Next slide. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Adunas for having me. And I hope this presents an overview and I look forward to the more specific presentations and the review of the, of the journal club manuscripts. That is a wonderful way to begin because it shows us where we're headed and why this is so important. And Professor DePetty, I was saying, get ready. I'm sure we'll have questions for you. Okay. This whole idea of an individual approach versus a public health approach versus a public uh, health service, that creates a lot of noise in the clinic. So get ready because we're going to have some good questions for you when we get to the Q&A. Now, I wanted to move ahead and say, okay, right now we were looking at the countries we have with us. We have 12 countries that are implementing this model, including this standardized protocol that you just described in the last few minutes. And also some other good news is that we are in the fourth cohort of HEARTS countries. Today, we are welcoming to this webinar are colleagues from Bolivia. They just officially joined and also our colleagues from the British Virgin Islands. They too joined officially. And also I wanted to welcome our colleagues from Porto Alegre, Brazil. So that means that we have three more countries joining hearts. So that makes 16. Plus there are two more countries that are getting ready. And we hope that very soon they will be joining us. Now, the good thing about moving on to the next presentation is that this webinar has participants in Paraguay, Uruguay, Venezuela, and Costa Rica, and they aren't yet implementing this model in their countries. So I'm sure they'll have a lot of questions. Now, having said that, I can go on to introduce our second speaker on cardiovascular disease, stroke, hypertension, outcomes crisis in COVID-19 era. And here I am introducing Daniel Lackland. Daniel comes from the Division of Translational Neurosciences and Population Studies of the Department of Neurology at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina, United States. So Professor Daniel Lackland, it is a pleasure and an honor to introduce you to the hearts community. Right now we have some 400 people with us. So please go ahead, uh, Professor Lackland. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Pedro. And thank you. It's so wonderful to be here with a lot of very, very good friends and certainly colleagues from all throughout the world. I want to talk a little bit about where we are with, with stroke, hypertension, et cetera, very similar to what uh, Professor DePetty 
was bringing forward. As we look and think of the COVID-19, this is a slide that I think is very important as we consider our direction. And as you can see, uh, beginning when we began the pandemic and seeing it affecting uh, the group in this, in this particular case in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the U, in the US and directions, you started to see the deaths coming from COVID-19, these excess deaths that, that we see throughout. And then they're coming down perhaps another plateau looking at the deaths. This is important because it's you're, what you're seeing is that the COVID deaths are not replacing our traditional deaths from, from heart disease, from stroke, from kidney disease, hypertension related diseases. Those are remaining the same. And our group is still dying of well, folks that were at this, almost at the similar type of, of conditions we're still seeing that throughout the time. So we're not doing what we're just seeing is a little bit of extra that we're seeing that's coming from the COVID-19. Another, another piece of that is, is that uh, most of the deaths that we still have in, in, our, in our populations are still coming from those traditional reasons for death. And that's heart disease, uh, hyper, hypertension related conditions. So it's not going away, it's staying with us and, it's, and we can't take a pause and totally divert ourselves to the COVID-19 without recognizing that, that the hypertension related conditions still are causing us problem. This is just a map you've seen quite often that not only do we see conditions in this particular case looking at stroke as a leading cause of death throughout the world, we begin to also see that in certain parts of the, of the world, stroke is the leading cause of death and all throughout. And uh, this diversity is so very, very important. If we look and focus at the Western hemisphere, we see that again, stroke in many places turns out to be one of the, it certainly is the leading, a leading cause of death. In many places, it is the leading cause of death and disability, a hypertension related condition. looking considerably more and bringing in these hypertension related uh, parts throughout the world, two points to make. As we begin to see stroke, ischemic heart disease are leading the way all throughout the world as main causes, hypertension related conditions all throughout the world, leading reasons for disability, cost, and certainly morbidity. As we see this, the other point to make is that we see a tremendous amount of diversity. We see changes where some groups, while stroke and hypertension related conditions are major problems, they do vary by, by country as to how severe and how much of a part that this is going to be. If we look just one more, more situation and thinking about the, the contribution that we see very, very similar. We see this in men and in women. So we're not looking at a gender specific or a gender greater risk, less risk, nor are we seeing with this with regards to race and ethnicity. Stroke affects many, many people and it affects people as, and brings it through hypertension related conditions affect many, many portions of the population. I want to focus just for a moment on on the on, on the United States and looking at at stroke and stroke mortality, where we see that global effect uh, through, throughout, where we're seeing diversity and carrying through. We see the same thing in the United States, and in particular, this has been a pattern that we've seen uh, throughout where stroke disproportionately affects individuals that live in the South and in particular the Southeastern portion of the United States where Professor DePetty and I live here as our state. Many have referred to this as the stroke belt, the uh, hypertension belt, if you will, with states like South Carolina, Georgia being 
what people would refer to as the heart of the stroke belt. The point is that we see this diversity, that we see portions of our population all throughout the world affected differently by hypertension and by hypertension related conditions. Well, we, I would like to share some uh, results of a report that we've just brought through uh, very, very recently, a paper published in Circulation that has shown the things that Dr. DePetty was referring to, that where we can, can we do something? So here is a plan with hearts, can we do it? Let's share what happened in, that, in the South where we had the greatest risk of hypertension, where many people said, you can't do anything. This population is at great risk and they're at great risk at a different time. So we focused in on blood pressure distributions from 1960 to 2005. At a time when we had the stroke belt where people were dying of very, very strong and elevated blood pressures that were way out. In fact, 10% of, of the population in 1960 in the South had systolic blood pressures greater than 200. 10%. Well, what we show here is that for both whites and for blacks, the, the distribution of blood pressures has shifted to the left. It's shifted in, in all segments of the population and in all percentiles. So certainly those individuals with the elevated blood pressures that we would see that deserve treatment, you saw a shift to the left, no doubt due to good pharmacological therapy. But as another piece of hearts and another piece of the part, you know, those individuals that are not quite ready for therapy yet, but are also ready for lifestyle modification. We, shot, we showed a shift in the blood pressures for those individuals as well during this uh, 45 year period. So a shift to the left in all segments of the population, in all groups in our population, and also we, we, we showed it for all percentiles of blood pressure. So it's showing that the components of hearts can indeed work and it's based on evidence. And here is some evidence in a very, very high risk population. From this paper, I would, did want to share one more piece uh, that kind of emphasizes this point. And this is looking at the blood pressures. Notice that all age groups, you saw a significant reduction in systolic blood pressure in all age groups for, for whites as well as for blacks. All age groups, a very, very significant reduction in elevated blood pressure came forward. So we know it works. It works in all segments of the population, the very high risk, the less risk, and all age groups, both genders and all ethnic and racial groups. So let's summarize uh, briefly what we, what we do know. We know that the highest mortality attributed to, uh, to cardiovascular disease typically have been seen in, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. You know that the cardiovascular prevalence uh, was high in the United States, Central uh, Europe, North America, and the Middle East, bringing that forward. We also know that the overall, uh, in, in, in 2017, the stroke prevalence, again, was highest. Again, looking at that racial, I mean, that geographic diversity where we're seeing different groups uh, experiencing higher rates, but everybody experiencing disadvantages from elevated blood pressure. And then the top of those, thinking about, uh, thinking about hemorrhagic strokes, seeing those in those populations with the very highest levels of blood pressure. What we also showed was that between uh, 1990 and 2015, that the number of deaths related to uh, uh, hypertension did not increase in high, in high income countries, but did increase in high middle income countries. So we're seeing that the deaths, again, going back in here, bringing up for us a very important need in all portions of the country that we need to address these excess risks and we need to address them very, very quickly that we can uh, start to lower. And now you have a plan that could actually do this. And again, based on our data, there's 
almost 3.5 billion adults worldwide with with systolic blood pressures between uh, 110 and 115 or and higher. And of this group, 874 million had systolic blood pressures greater than uh, greater than 140. So the population is here. Indeed, we know that we need to do something about it. And this is our call. And now we have something that maybe can do and make that factor. The clinical implications, finally, that we do have. The clinical strategies for high blood pressure detection, very important, measuring blood pressure, treatment and control, implemented in the latter part of the last century, again, is effective in all, in all individuals. We know that the primordial and, pr and primary prevention activities that we also implemented in the clinical setting can have significant impact on blood pressure levels. And we also know that the early detection of hypertension using proper blood pressure measurement and prompt appropriate treatment can be effective in the high blood pressure control for all patients, regardless of, of population and social determinants. I think a very important thing, we have it right now. I'm so pleased to be a part and to support this effort to implement HARS. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Yes. I'm sorry, I lost my screen. That was excellent, Professor Lackland. That was a very uh, enlightening and clarifying presentation. I listened very carefully, and we have been writing down the questions. When the team is ready to receive your questions, we'll get to those so that after the next presentation, we can take a break and hear, uh, go to the questions and answers. I see that we have many questions and answers so far. We'll handle some of them through the chat, but we'll uh, bring some directly to our panelists as well. And this is an, an extremely relevant topic. Uh, the world has been put in a tight place with COVID-19 that is really aggravating the problem we already had with cardiovascular disease. Hypertension has very high prevalence almost everywhere in the world. And as Professor Lackland said, it attends all population groups. It's a very serious phenomenon. And COVID found the perfect brewing pot to attack these people even more. And in order to respond to this tremendous challenge, we may have to innovate. We may have to do things differently. Otherwise, we won't be able to rebuild better if we don't change the way we look at things. For this reason, I have now invited Professor Kenneth Connell from Barbados, who is going to tell us, uh, going to draw our attention to innovations in cardiovascular disease and hypertension care. Lessons learned from COVID-19. And this will help us to rebuild our health services in a better way. I welcome you, Professor, and thank you and give you the floor. So thank you so much, Pedro, for your kind introduction. I was going to try to share my video, but I think I need permission from the host. Uh, and good morning, good afternoon from a very overcast and uh, wet Barbados. The weather forecast today was actually meant to be bright and sunny, but this is 2020. And so it, nothing is surprising me during the year. I think this is a very relevant conversation because COVID-19 has disrupted the health landscape. It has disrupted our lives. And the one thing that might be beneficial coming out of all of this is that we kind of build back, back better, which is what WHO has proposed. And we don't do things exactly the way we did before COVID-19. So I will start with my first slide. 
uh, which I am not seeing on my end. Perfect. Next slide. So over the next 10 minutes, I hope to convince you that there is this relationship in the healthcare setting between COVID-19 and the non-communicable diseases with special reference to hypertension. I hope that you'll be able to identify some potential public health implications, which many of us have, as healthcare professionals are already experiencing, especially in countries and regions where this pandemic has ravaged our health systems. Design a strategy for telemedicine, which is one of the innovations that I see coming out of this, and also to formulate a plan for remote monitoring and management of blood pressure. And maybe to appreciate some of the ethical responsibilities that we have for delivering safe care, even on a telemedicine platform. Next slide. So I think everyone kind of knows the schematic. I'm gonna, however, still drill down on it because it's so important. Uh, we have all experienced, many of our countries, the ravages of this first wave, which is the immediate mortality and morbidity caused by COVID-19. It was unexpected. It was unprecedented in our lifetime, certainly. And I guess in some respect, we could have said, we could also claim that our healthcare systems were not as agile as we thought they were to respond to the pandemic. And so there was the emergency need for ventilators and for drugs and uh, for a plan and plans evolved as this pandemic evolved. And though we may not, although we cannot say that we have, uh, uh, well, maybe we can say now about at least one or two vaccines, uh, certainly the way we manage COVID-19 patients has improved uh, since we were first met with the pandemic. And then the second wave is really the impact of resource restrictions for non-urgent conditions. And I'm really gonna drill into these because this is really what is the NCDs has taken a hit, a hit on. The third wave was the impact of interrupted care on chronic conditions, again, uh, affecting the non-communicable diseases like hypertension. And the third wave, which is affecting all of us uh, to whether we have either been directly affected by COVID-19 or whether we have had uh, our care disrupted by non-communicable diseases, all of our patients, all of us on this planet are affected by the mental health issues surrounding COVID-19 and of course the economic issues, which we have no control over. Next slide. And so I really like this thematic because it certainly speaks to what happened in Barbados. And I'm sure it's similar to my other Caribbean neighbors in St. Lucia and, and Trinidad and Tobago. And I know that Jamaica is also on this call. The first services that were disrupted really are identified in this bar graph. Rehabilitation services are the only rehab center on the island, which has just about 285,000 uh, citizens was rehab services at the Heart and Stroke Foundation. It closed immediately because gyms were not a safe place to be. Even if we wanted to have our staff there, certainly patients weren't going to come because they're faced with this disease, which you're seeing on social media and on the local news, is having a devastating effect in other countries. And the next thing you can see here was also relevant to Barbados and the, the region, and that's hypertension management. Clinics closed. Think about this, a tertiary hospital, the only tertiary hospital on the island re managing resistant hypertension cases and all of a sudden the hospital resources, human resources, attention, the whole strategic plan shifted from the pan endemic which we became so accustomed to, focused solely and squarely on the COVID-19 pandemic. And so clinics were canceled, we rescheduled patients, they were told you, you need to collect your prescription uh, from at this point, or, or actually the pharmacist may deliver the prescription or medication to you. We then realized that we did not have accurate contacts for patients. So some people, we just could not contact them. Obviously the mail service was disrupted, so you can't send them a, something in the post either. It was quite chaotic. And this occurred across several other clinics diabetes and diabetic complications management is shown here, asthma, palliative care, all of the NCDs, even urgent dental care, which I can speak from personal experience, was interrupted 
because of course, there's a high risk environment in a dentist's office. Next slide. And if you weren't convinced that this was related at all to COVID-19, well, well, look at the percentage of services disrupted depending on the phase of disease spread from sporadic cases in blue, phase two, to cluster um, spread. And we were fortunate locally to only have had cluster spread. And look at the amount affected in community spread of the disease in phase four, where almost 70% of hypertension services were disrupted. These patients did not press pause. And I really like what Dan said in the beginning of his presentation, you know, we cannot take a pause. Usually when you're faced with an emergency, like a flat tire or your, your roof is leaking, you kind of pause everything else and deal with that emergency. The healthcare fraternity did not have that luxury because the NCDs were presenting. Um, so we couldn't press pause. Next slide. Then of course there was task shifting, which this group knows very well about task shifting because it's part of the HEARTS program. All NCD staff were partially reassigned. That was about 33%. Some of the NCD staff were partially reassigned, 25%. So that's more than 50% of reassignment. Some NCD staff reassigned full-time. Uh, in fact, although Barbados has been quite lucky to only have uh, imported cases uh, coming into the island, there still hasn't been the complete reassignment of staff back to the NCD clinics. And that's an interesting phenomenon where we are so much on guard that we no longer even want the comfort of reassigning staff back into their traditional role. But guess what? The NCDs, including hypertension, they have not taken a pause. They continue. The revolving door of heart failure and all of the complications of NCDs are actually increased at our hospital. Next slide. And so this just re-emphasizes the whole building back better. 66% uh, of countries have included the continuity of NCD services in their national COVID-19 plans. And but as you can see, that's the really depending on how much money and your socioeconomic status. You know, we have vulnerable economies in small island developing countries such as Barbados and in many countries of the region, money has to be shifted to fight a pandemic. It also has to be shifted to counteract the effects of climate change. And there are competing priorities that governments have. And so you don't have an end, a bottomless pot of money to kind of just spend on COVID-19. And so innovation has to come in. Next slide. And how we build that back better. So countries were really asking for urgent guidance from the World Health Organization. How to provide continuity of NCD programs? And here are some questions. For instance, how to include NCDs in public health emergency protocols? Imagine a public health emergency protocol that actually spoke to NCDs, which we don't tend to see as a national emergency as we do see an infectious disease like a novel coronavirus how to develop national NCD toolkits for use in emergencies. Now, this is where the very complex and large document of guidelines can really become quite even more cumbersome because not only do you need a simplified algorithm that you might find on one page like the HEARTS algorithm, but you have to be able to find it quickly. You have to be able to train staff who are not accustomed to managing certain conditions in the NCD outpatient clinic. And you also have to have an important person in this whole chorus on board, and that's the patient. The algorithm has to be simplified enough and simple enough that even patients, or especially patients, can understand it. And also how to provide medical care for NCDs through telemedicine and digital solutions. So any of you on the call who know me very well, uh, including Don DePetty, who I know is shaking his head, I'm always glued to my mobile phone, so I use technology quite a lot. Next slide. Technology offered a solution in COVID-19. You know, besides social distancing, wearing a mask, protective wear, educating the public, now you have this platform that you can possibly continue care at a safe distance during a pandemic. Next slide. So telehealth is really a holistic and uh, approach to 
uh, telemedicine. It's integrated use of communication devices. Uh, there's clinical and non-clinical telemedicine can occur. And the practice of medicine to deliver care at a physical distance is really what you're aiming for. So the physician is nowhere near the actual person that, or healthcare provider, I should say, physician, nurse, pharmacist, is nowhere near the patient, but is still providing care. And not just saying, calling on the telephone and saying, well, I'm just going to increase, move you to step two. It's having a conversation as we are now and finding out, well, how are you coping in COVID-19? Uh, have you had any side effects? Uh, you can even have a look at the ankle edema on telemedicine. So you have that kind of authentic interaction with the patient and you're able to deliver care. Next slide. So mobile health and telemed and blood pressure med um, really go hand in hand. It's, it's fortuitous that COVID-19 occurred to bring this union even closer together because certainly things should never go back the way they were before. In my hypertension clinic, for instance, in my private clinic, which is on Mondays and Thursdays, my Thursday clinic, despite only having imported cases of COVID-19 nationally, has remained as telemedicine because it's more efficient. And my nurses uh, have been involved in it. Uh, they've been using the H protocol of hearts remotely. I have been using the E protocol and the other protocols. So it is a seamless transition, but the most important person in the center of all of this is the patient who's actually following the simplified protocol because he knows, he or she knows what's the next step. Next slide. So here are some do's for telemedicine, okay? Determine the type of patient you're going to see. Don't be biased by things such as, oh, well, maybe my elderly patients are not gonna do too well on telemedicine. I have a 92 year old who now has a smartphone who probably only uses it for her telemedicine visit, but who I see via telemedicine. There's coaching and training, which is actually exciting because you are on a new platform with patients. This is new for you as well if you haven't been using it before. Uh, patients and staff may be involved in the coaching, but here's the added benefit. You no longer have to worry about how am I gonna get the patient support structure in because relatives may be there, uh, other caretakers may be there. They're all on the teleconsult call with you and it provides a kind of an extended uh, network of support. Front end, the consultation. I would say that this is probably the most important part of the consultation. Agree on what you're going to kind of discuss in setting your agenda uh, and then send them reminders, for instance, that the consultation is coming up, what time it is, the platform that's being used, I have to admit, my office staff did all of this work for me so that I appeared even more uncomfortable than my patients sometimes on the platform because they've used it, they would have used it so many times speaking to the nurse about salt reduction or trying to avoid taking over the counter painkillers or even getting some more physical activity in. Uh, and so they were quite comfortable with it. And of course, at the end of the consultation, you have to kind of close the consultation. Next slide. Of course, you need the right attitude. I have to say that some of my colleagues entered telemedicine kicking and screaming, and dare I say coughing as well, uh, but they, they really did not want, they saw it as an alternative that they really did not want to engage in rather than an opportunity to connect with patients that you possibly would not have been able to do before. So see it, the platform as an opportunity. Remember, it doesn't replace the authentic face-to-face -face visit in many circumstances, but it is an alternative platform. And of course, we offer training through our neighborhood university I have here. So the University of the West Indies offered training for healthcare providers because it's not as easy as it looks either. It's not just about turning on your camera and getting started. It does take training because it is a unique style of consultation. And if you are hopeless with IT, then you also need some IT support as well there. And you can use your EMR or you can use a paper-based system. It really doesn't matter. I use a combination of both. Uh, there are several platforms out there that are actually free that you can get started on. And it's always helpful to have several dry runs, not just one dry run, but several. Just to be sure you're absolutely comfortable with the platform. Next slide. 
And this just describes one of the devices that I use, which is called the, the mHealth uh, blood pressure monitoring device. Uh, so it's shown right here. I'm not sure if my, my scroll is, is coming across on your screen. But, so patients essentially have the device at home. They put it on, they do readings twice a day or as directed by the healthcare provider. The results all come to a dashboard. Next slide. Okay, so this is what the device looks like. It connects to your smartphone. Yes, I do have an iPhone bias and it tracks your readings. Uh, patients don't have to write anything because the readings all go towards the dashboard, which might have set alarms and reminders and checks. And if you're fortunate like myself and you have a nurse in your practice who's kind of monitoring these results, she can give them a call and say, well, your blood pressures are actually trending up or your blood pressure is actually looking quite good. Maybe we can extend your appointment further. Next slide. And this slide just kind of shows what the dashboard looks like. So it gives you a lot of information, not just on blood pressure. I mean, other information you can put in there as well. So patients can do their home weight. I mean, I guess you're really looking for a change in weight. So they might be using their own home scale, which is standardized, hopefully. Uh, so you could compare whether they've gained weight, or you can do other measurements such as waist circumference if they're trained to do so. But more importantly, you can document their blood pressures and the various attempts that they've had to reduce salt, phys increase physical activity, decrease alcohol, especially in lockdowns, as well as attempts to stop smoking. Next slide. Okay, so my take home points really is that COVID does represent a contemporaneous an unpredictable public health challenge. And public health mitigation measures uh, offer some defense, but it poses challenges for non-COVID cases, such as non-communicable diseases. Delayed care will influence both mortality and morbidity, as Dan Lachlan showed, related to NCDs, uh, including hypertension, plus all the other NCDs. Remote management is a possibility for the management of blood pressure, you can actually think of blood pressure as an ideal NCD to be managed remotely because all the gadgets that are used for home blood pressure monitoring, which is kind of what we want, are easily accessible, are quite reasonable now, and it's really just incorporating that into remote consultation. Next slide. Telemedicine allows for that type of consultation, uh, but training and auditing are required. Do not kind of get into this just Without any training, you will need some training. Standardized treatment algorithms reduce inertia, not just for the doctor, but more important, the patient who is following the same algorithm and kind of knows what the next step is. And mobile health may offer an innovative way to monitor blood pressure and other health metrics. Next slide. And I am going to finish here. And I do believe that there is an, a, a bonus slide at the end compliments, Paho. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to your questions. So I'm not sure if I'm meant to narrate, but it seems quite obvious uh, to most of us dealing with blood pressure, support the feet, keep the legs on cross, Many of our medical students know this quite well because it's a checklist that's used in their assessment of how well they are at coaching patients to take a home reading. Thank you very much and over to you, Pedro. Thank you, Ken, that was wonderful as always. Very eloquent, very up-to-date, always bringing in the challenge of technology Knowledge and I know that when your Wi-Fi is down, you get very nervous. So yes, we all have to make sure that we have our technology available so that we can do everything that we need to do on a timely basis. Now, I liked what you said about by postponing care, all you do is increase the risk of death or complications. And that is a very powerful message. And I would like 
to make sure, make sure that that gets shared with everyone, with our bosses, with the people we supervise. In other words, a postponement in care means increasing risk and complications and death. So with that, I would go back to Don. Don was very eloquent in the first part of this session. He was talking about an individual and a public health approach. But let me tell you, Professor DePetty, you can believe everything he says. His expertise is widely recognized. He takes clinical action, and that is the way he has devoted his wife to his practice. And now that clinic is saying, look, we need to have the necessary practice guidelines. We need to update our protocol if we want to improve. Now, that isn't always well received by some sectors, right? Right, Professor DePetty? We know that there are challenges. Some people think that having a protocol, a standardized treatment protocol reduces their ability of deciding individually what to give each patient. But it's also true, Professor DePetty, that the control of high blood pressure is very low in countries, even the most advanced countries in the world. And that is what produces the consequences that we are acquainted with. So would you like to comment on that question? Because that's a question that often comes up. So Pedro, thank you. And we had the exact same uh, issues here uh, when we started our algorithm, which does include two medications uh, in the initial management of hypertension and of course, uh, a fixed protocol. What I say, what I say to the in, initially is individualized care and population public health approach is they're they're not uh, mutually exclusive. As a matter of fact, they go they go hand in hand. Once we started initiating uh, the algorithm, the protocol, the smaller formulary, if you will, it's important to find champions, champions that are on the ground. Uh, and actually, I would line those champions up initially, uh, and obviously bring in all the stakeholders. Once the results came in, and once we saw control rates really rapidly increasing, then the buy-in just automatically happens. But it, 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 it is heavy lifting, and, and we, don't want, we don't want to take the individual physician or healthcare providers for granted. Uh, we need to talk to them, get them on board, tell them why we're doing what we're doing, demonstrating success of hearts in our 12 uh, countries, our first cohorts and now beyond. And then it's been, it's been a much easier task. Right, right. Doctor, I think this is a key issue and we have to continue to insist on how important primary health care is in managing hypertensives and diabetics in systems that are still quite fragmented, where access to health services is complicated, where there are lots of barriers that stand in the way of access to health care. So if we don't strengthen that primary level, we lose what Dr. O'Connell was saying. He said, okay, if people don't have access to treatment, if they don't have access to medication, we're postponing treatment. And that is definitely going to mean a situation that's even worse. So now I think the message is clear. We need to have more health resources. We're not saying let's take resources away from COVID. No, quite the contrary. We have to respond to COVID, but we have to realize that we have to still deal with CVD. Now, I wanted to ask Dr. Lachlan to mention something that was also mentioned by Dr. DePetty, and that is to refer to what has happened in some countries, even in the United States and in some other countries too. After decades of systematic decrease in cardiovascular mortality and especially decreasing 
mortality due to cerebral vascular disease, we're beginning to see that that curve has turned around. In some countries, cardiovascular mortality is actually moving up. And what we have found is that hypertension programs have suffered in quality, especially at the primary health care level. So Dr. Lachlan, perhaps you could comment on that and tie it in with another subject too, because the most vulnerable groups of the population from an economic standpoint are those that suffer from cardiovascular disease and COVID-19 from both diseases. So Daniel Lackland, please comment on what I just said. Thank you. Very good, Pedro. Thank you. I think it's a. I think it's a brilliant. Uh, it's a brilliant observation, but a very, very critical observation as everyone, uh, Ken and Don, have both uh, em em emphasized. One of the thoughts is that when we were first, at least in the in, in most of the world, the, the, when we began to see the excitement from the 70s and 80s and showing that you can really lower blood pressure, and we got very enthusiastic about it, and it may have been a little bit of that kind of, I hate to say, fear or, 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 or a, a comfort in saying maybe we've, maybe we've cured hypertension, which is not the truth, but maybe some other things took, uh, took interest in this case, uh, COVID-19 is one of those things, diabetes, other conditions, uh, cholesterol came in and said, well, now that we've got blood pressure under control, which again, was false, maybe we've kind of took our foot off the pedal and lost some of that uh, interest and, and, and enthusiasm. I think as we begin to, so we're starting to have a little bit of a renaissance where we're bringing in new, a, a new refocus on blood pressure and knowing what we what we can do for countries that are developing and a little bit behind the curve i think what we did show from the 70s and 80s and 90s these dramatic improvements with regards to outcomes i think are something to to show the other piece there is i think we need to regenerate our uh, our our focus and i think that can be another uh, another piece as well is bring back that focus to blood pressure and in one sense that's what hearts is doing that's what the surgeon general's report's doing that's what that's what we're all doing right here is saying no we haven't cured it yet we're moving forward and and uh, but it's a it's a great opportunity but one a brilliant question His microphone is off. Yes. He is muted. What I was saying is that not only have we not cured it, but when we see a deterioration in our accomplishments, of course, the curve goes up again, which reminds us that if we do not systematically treat hypertension, if we do not take care of it. And of course, there's a preventive component, but also the care component. And you have to strike the right balance. So what that does is worsen the condition. Now, sometimes I wonder, why do we have so many complications in patients with cardiovascular disease? Is it because of the cardiovascular disease or is it because of COVID? So what we do have to realize that we have a lot of people with high blood pressure. If you take 3 million people, 3 million people with hypertension, and when we look at risk factors, the most frequent one in the populations, we know can control it. And so that is why we were just reminded that we have to take a different approach. If every day you do the same things in the same way and things aren't working out, that means that something has to change, not only because now we have COVID, but because we should have changed those things pre-COVID. And I would ask Dr. Kenneth to go back to an issue that he has raised other times. So in addition to technology, which is very, very important, and I think that telemedicine is here to stay. I don't think we'll ever go back. And there are 
patients that are going to benefit from telemedicines. Others will benefit less. But I would like for Dr. Kenneth to go back to something very important, and that is the role of the healthcare team. Now, you have traveled with us to all the Latin American countries. You have been in all of our healthcare systems. And you know, if it's not the physician taking the blood pressure, no one else does it because the rest of the healthcare team is hand tied. They cannot help. So would you like to make a comment? I've heard you talk about this issue other times. Sure. So thank you so much, Pedro, for bringing that up. And uh, let me just say that without the establishment, and I'm going to say this unconditionally, without the establishment of a strong healthcare team for the management of hypertension, this whole pandemic could have caused a lot more disruptions to care. And that is because the healthcare team allowed for very fast and agile task shifting and task sharing because everyone kind of knew what everyone's role was and could kind of fit into that person's place. Remember, I started off by saying that Barbados never had community spread. We had a few clusters uh, and now imported cases. Look at what has happened at our hospital. Our heart failure admission rates have gone up by 52%. This is just a country where people have preferred not to go to hospital because of a fear and not because of spread of a pandemic. They just haven't gone because of a fear of being infected. And as a result, because of that pause that Don was, Dan was speaking about, we now have recently, last week, our hospital announced we have no more beds. They're all filled with not COVID cases. They're filled with complications of NCDs, stroke, myocardial infarctions, heart failures that are have represented. And if you take a closer look at some of these presentations, they have been because people have spaced out medications, they've just stopped taking them, they just haven't been seen. The healthcare team in, in hearts allows for, for instance, a nurse to do a follow-up visit on a patient who is reasonably controlled or who knows what's the next step uh, to advise that patient to escalate to the next step. They, so that by having a nurse that's trained basically on the same page, literally it's one page, you're able to shift because you never know when the doctor may be shifted from the role of doing a blood pressure to intubating the patient. And these are things we have to consider. And this is why I think hearts makes the agility of managing hypertension so much better. Very good comment. So I think that the advice is clear. And now I'm going back to Don because Professor Don DePetty said, okay, we have a treatment algorithm, but he also talked about medication. And we know that one of the major barriers that we have in the region is access to medication. So I would like for you, Don DePetty, to tell us why if we have a standardized treatment protocol, how can we optimize the use of medication? How can we assure that medication will be more available for patients? That is another advantage of having a standardized protocol. Professor DePetty? Pedro, ab absolutely. And I've made this comment uh, before, so pardon me if you've heard it before, but all politics is local. You know, all real estate is local. So that's why it becomes very important for the, we are, we are developing recommendations, we're developing blueprints, but we're not mandating. That's why the countries, the cohorts have been so successful uh, in hearts in America because they developed the protocols. They knew the accessibility of the medications. They knew what they could afford. They knew what was culture, what physicians and providers would, would accept and also what they wouldn't accept. And I think that's why it's been so, that's one key point as to why it's been so successful. And again, we, we, we did the stepwise approach. Start with a current protocol. Dr. Skeeth is gonna review a paper that emphasizes that shortly, uh, but then also start planning the ideal or the acceptable uh, protocol and then the preferred protocol. It never stops. But the most important thing is get going. 
Start somewhere and start now, not yesterday. Great. Always the message is, yes, it is a challenge, but we have to tackle it and we have to do so now because we already heard it. Postponing care only increases the risk of complications and death. Now, I have another question here, Daniel Lackland. Now, I think we're all going to see our resources cut back further. Health care systems have been overtaken. Governments are stretched. It is a true economic crisis. We have a risk of more limited care. So those in charge of health care, the ministries, the policymakers, they have to hear from people at your level, prestigious professors saying, OK, what is our priority? What would you advise be the priorities, Dr. Lackland, if we had to do two or three things? What should we do to begin to walk down this path? We knew that the risk of reaching 2030 without complying with the Sustainable Development Goals were already high before COVID, but now it's going to be even harder. So what would you say to the politicians so that our heart centers, so that everyone would know what those priorities should be. Go ahead. Very, very nice. Um, the first thing I would do is remind the politicians about history, remind them what may be what some of us believe was the best in the 20th century, the best public health success rate, the success story. And that was the control of blood pressure and the reduction of of, um, of, of, of disease and stroke, stroke and looking at those declines, a true, true success story. We can even see Franklin Roosevelt, president of the United States, had a systolic blood pressure of 300 right before he had a stroke and died. We don't see that anymore. We see high blood pressure, but we don't see those strokes that were so, those blood pressures that were so excessive. So we know that it can be there. If we know that it can be a success with things like, and now we have the agents. I mean, just look what Hearts is doing. Hearts is actually an economic plan as well. It's the team approach. Ken, that was, that was beautiful. No, the, the physician doesn't need to measure the blood pressure. And Don, you come up, th those are reasonably priced drugs. We're not, we're not pulling out an agent that's gonna cost somebody hundreds of dollars a, a month. It's very, very economic. We have telehealth where now you can reduce the cost associated with the, with the meeting. And very importantly, you have uh, self blood, home blood pressure monitoring that you're, that you're promoting right up in here. So now the patient takes role or, or the population takes responsibility for themselves. Measure your blood pressure, know what your blood pressure is and Take implement that with and complement the medical care system so that you're not putting a burden on it. If you're controlling your blood pressure the way you're able to, maybe I don't need to come in and burden the my physician and my team right there. So I think it's a it's a beautiful model based on evidence, based on success, and I just need to facilitate it. And I need to and with the politician saying, this is our top priority, but we know that we can, that we can do it. Excellent. Professor Kenneth Collard, Connell, I'm gonna tell you something right now. Let's see if you recall at the end of 2016, when we were meeting there in Chile, we had four countries and seven health centers implementing hearts. At, that's the end of 2016, four countries, seven health centers. Now we have 15 countries, 12 countries implementing, three additional countries complementing implementation and we have 362 health centers throughout the region. However, there are still countries that have not joined. We have 15 so far. And I think we might have 17 within a 
few days. And recall that in the entire hearts community, we've said by 2025, heart shall be the cardiovascular, cardiovascular health model of care for this region. So why is primary health care so key? You've been clear in telling countries to not, or uh, haven't ha been able to join heart. What is the message that you have for them who haven't been able to do this yet? You have the floor, Professor Connor. I think our message has to change now, Pedro, and I think it has to reflect the current world that we live in. Our message now has to be that it is so important for you to get your NCDs under control because you could be faced with a pandemic like COVID-19 or God forbid COVID-25 or 42 or whatever in the future. And therefore your communities could be at significant risk. It's not just the chronic talk, cl um, clock ticking on a daily basis of MIs and strokes and heart failure, because if that isn't bad enough, you now are creating high risk populations by not controlling your NCDs. And so here's hearts. Not only is it addressing the chief and the primary driver of these events, hypertension, but it's a simple roadmap because guess what? Your health services may be called to do other things like fight a pandemic, but now you have a roadmap that's simply fight enough that you can easily take it up. People can get on board a team. The team can become really good at what they do. And even if task shifting has to occur, if something happens in the future, you still can continue. I think hearts is even more relevant post COVID-19 than it was before. But I think we need to kind of get that message out there to the rest of the world. Excellent, excellent. Now, before we go on to the next segment, we're gonna have an active uh, activity break. We're gonna let you stretch and stand up. And our colleagues from St. Lucia say we're gonna uh, move our bones a little bit because obesity and lack of physical activity and excessive use of salt are what kills us. So uh, let's stand up for an active pause and take a few seconds to get back really quickly. And should we be hearing some sort of music or, or no? All right, getting back, that was a mini pause. We do need to do a little exercise, but we'll now go right into our session two. And we have tons of questions, but time is getting away from us. But for this session two, we are going to present uh, the late breaking journal club headlines about what's been published in HEART. And I now have the pleasure to turn the floor back over to Dr. Donald DuPetri, uh, uh, Health Sciences Distinguished Professor. I have no problem in repeating this because we had only 200 some participants when we started and first introduced him, but now we have twice as many people. So it's okay to repeat this. And Professor DuPetri, you have the microphone now. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Pedro. Um, let's go ahead then uh, and move on to the second session, which really I think is a very uh, interesting and, and unique opportunity. And that is to discuss late breaking journal club headlines. Uh, we are fortunate to have Dr. Skeeth uh, with us from the Division of Cardiology and Rush uh, Medical Center and University in Chicago. And Dr. Skeeth is gonna discuss two papers that recently came out. 
that several of us, of course, a uh, little bit biased, a little bit prejudiced here, I must admit, uh, participated in. And one public, the first publication is going to be Approaches to the Management of Hypertension in Resource Limited Settings, but specifically Strategies to Overcome the Hypertension Crisis in the Post-COVID Era. Uh, Dr. Skeeth, why don't you go ahead uh, and review this paper for us, discuss its importance, and more importantly, its implications. And then we'll talk about the second paper. Thank you, Dr. DePetty, for your introduction. And I'd like to also take this um, opportunity and use this forum to congratulate um, Dr. Arjunis and the entire PAHO community for the excellent work that's being done in um, addressing the hypertension crisis that is currently plaguing not only places within the Caribbean and Latin America, but across the globe as a whole. I recall when this pilot was started in Barbados almost six or seven years ago, um, how much effort was made and it's fascinating to see how widely it has been have taken throughout the region. So as Dr. DePetty would have mentioned, I'm a member of the Division of Cardiology at Rush University Medical Center here in Chicago, Illinois in the United States. And the first uh, paper that we'll be discussing um, is the approaches to the management of hypertension in resource limited settings. And it will be focusing on looking at strategies to overcome the hypertension crisis in the post COVID era. Now, the main aim of this particular manuscript was to explore the overlap between the COVID-19 pandemic and the hypertension crisis. You know, initially, we thought of these as two distinct entities, but there are a number of significant lessons that can be learned from the approach to the management of COVID-19 that can be applied to hypertension. And we think that this is something that is worth highlighting. And then we think that we should describe a framework for the management of hypertension based on these lessons learned. Now let's start by looking at the hypertension paradigm. And a lot of this is based on the COVID-19 paradigm that we've seen um, unfold before us. Like with the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a big discussion about addressing risk factors and in hypertension is identifying the risk factors that have traditionally been unaddressed. In hypertension paradigm, there's significant failure to diagnose hypertension in large segments of the population. There's traditionally low treatment rates and poor cohort monitoring. Ultimately, inadequate treatment to goal or target blood pressure. And what this translates to is low control of hypertension as a whole and high complication rates. And tying this into what we have seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, where risk factors such as social distancing and use of masks has been elusive in some populations or in some settings. Large segments of the populations have failed to be diagnosed or their true COVID status has not been identified. In some instances, persons who are positive are not able to isolate themselves or take the necessary precautions to prevent spread. Ultimately, these persons go on to lead to more people becoming infected and high complications rate. So you can see that there's definitely some similarities between these two paradigms. So how can we go about improving hypertension control using this framework? So go ahead and in step one, address risk factors. Step two, determine the true prevalence of hypertension. Step three, improve the framework for the standardized treatment and management of hypertension. And step four, improve cohort monitoring. And a number of these steps are integral parts of the HEARTS program as well. So the manuscript goes to great length to describe the interplay between hypertension and the COVID-19 pandemic. So we've seen in the media and through organizations such as the World Health Organization and PAHO the need to address risk factors for the spread of COVID-19. And translating this to hypertension, you too have to identify and address risk factors that are resulting in spread of hypertension. And these strategies to reduce these risk factors such as reducing salt consumption, increasing levels of physical activity, maintaining a healthy weight, use of healthy foods, particularly plant-based nutrition, and avoiding tobacco products and following medical advice must be the message that we use to decrease the spread of hypertension. 
The second step is to determine the true prevalence of hypertension. The COVID-19 pandemic, there was discussions or there continues to be discussions surrounding widespread testing and developing a framework to permit population-based testing. And the same is true for hypertension as well, where we need to devise strategies to permit widespread testing of large segments of the population, such that persons who need to be hypertensive but not diagnosed can be identified and ultimately channeled into treatment. Now, a third area of interplay that was identified in this particular manuscript was the need to improve the framework for the standardized management of hypertension. Now, this image comes from my own hospital, um, Russian University Medical Center, where we had to significantly increase our capacity to treat persons the um, initial surge during the COVID-19 pandemic. And what we did here is utilize one of our um, waiting areas, our, our pavilion, to manage persons who are presenting to the hospital with symptoms consistent with COVID-19. The same improvement in the framework has to be applied to hypertension. I think no better system to date, at least in the Americas, has been described as that of the Heart and the Americas Initiative, which features several strategies to improve the framework um, for the management of hypertension, which has been discussed at length by some of our other presenters today. And finally, the fourth and probably one of the most important steps is that of improved cohort monitoring. In the COVID-19 pandemic, one theme that became particularly apparent was the need for contact tracing and following persons to see whether or not they have developed symptoms consistent with COVID-19 and ultimately have them tested and treated or at least um, take precautionary me measures to prevent um, further spread. And the same must be applied the hypertension, in which we have to, one, be able to ensure that larger um, numbers of the populations know their actual hypertension status, we're able to follow them through to treatment and ultimately determine whether or not our populations are reaching blood pressure targets. So the main take home point of this particular manuscript was that the hypertension crisis, like the COVID-19 pandemic, is a real one and it requires the attention that is currently being received by the COVID-19 pandemic. Like the COVID-19 pandemic, there is a dire need for decisive action to address the factors that have resulted in the high prevalence of hypertension and institute measures to decrease its spread. Similarly, the main take home point is that the lessons that are being learned in the aggressive approach to the management of COVID-19 must be applied to the hypertension pandemic as well. Now, along similar themes, um, the second manuscript, which was published in the Journal of Clinical Hypertension with a number of authors across the Latin America and the Caribbean region, as well as um, international authors in Europe and um, North America, is the standardized treatment to improve hypertension control in primary care. It looks at the hearts in the Americas initiative. Now, again, this manuscript is particularly timely, as was alluded to by Dr. Connell, where the need for the control of hypertension as a strategy to prevent negative outcomes in pandemics such as the COVID-19 pandemic is even more apparent now than it has been in the past. And this manuscript covers some of these aspects. The main aim of the manuscript was to describe the adoption of the evidence-based protocols or module E of the HEARTS protocol um, that um, Dr. DePetty would have mentioned in his initial presentation. As he would have mentioned as well, one of the key points that was identified in this particular manuscript was the features or the ideal characteristics of antihypertensive medications. And I think this point is so important that I will reiterate some of what he would have said before. These medications, as was mentioned in this manuscript, must have a high efficacy. They should have an additive or a synergistic approach to blood pressure reduction when used in combination. Their use should be supported by evidence-based clinical trials. They should have limited side effects. They should be affordable available and easily titrated, and when possible, be formulated as a single um, dose combination therapy. The manuscript then 
describe steps to build in a hypertension protocol. And I would define these as three major steps that the manuscript highlights. The first step is to select the drug classes that we want to use in the management of hypertension. And these would include drugs that are a part of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, um, such as ACE inhibitors and ARBs, calcium channel blockers, diuretics, and begrudgingly the use of beta blockers if indicated for other reasons. Step two is within each of these drug classes that we have identified, selecting the agents within these drug classes that are available in the particular environment in which we are practicing. And then the third and probably the most important step is to build a treatment algorithm using drugs within each drug class which meet the definitions of ideal characteristics. Now, one of the particularly important messages that was defined in this particular manuscript was the need for shifting to a preferred protocol. Dr. DePetty would have discussed this in his introductory statements as well. So in many environments, we already have a quasi-protocol that is in place. In many cases, it's not formalized, but there is you know, on the ground some form of practice that providers are using. What is important is that this needs to be standardized using the drugs that are available right now in that particular environment. And we've chosen to define this as a current protocol. But it is not desired to stay at that current protocol with time. The desire should be to align your prescribing practice to a more acceptable protocol where the drugs that are being used have improved properties compared to those that are being used at baseline. Now, normally these drugs may be already available on the drug formulary, but for whatever reason may not have been popular amongst the, providing provider, the prescribing providers. The ultimate goal is to transition prescription practice to that of a preferred protocol, which can be likened to best standard of practice. Now, this may require changing or adding drugs to the drug formulary, which are more efficacious and have been shown to be better or have improved outcomes in the treatment of hypertension. Now, the manuscript also gives an example of what might be a current protocol and how that may be adjusted or changed to a preferred protocol. So taking the example provided here, this protocol, the first step to the management would be to use the ARB losartan and amlodipine. And if blood pressure is not at goal, to titrate um, the dosages. If the blood pressure still is not at target, add in a third drug such as hydrochlorothiazide. And if further follow-up shows that blood pressure still remains not at goal, increasing the dose of hydrochlorothiazide even further. And ultimately, if blood pressure control remains elusive, referring the patient to a specialist or add in a fourth medication. Now, changing this prescribing practice to a preferred protocol could look something like this. Instead of using a short-acting ERB like Losartan, perhaps consider a long-acting ERB like Talmasartan. And we have identified that amlodipine is probably the most commonly prescribed ERB um, calcium channel blocker. So we don't really have any recommendations for an alternate agent in this setting. Now, if you look at step three, the diuretic of choice is is chlorothaladone in the preferred protocol compared to hydrochlorothiazide. And so on, the protocol continues similarly with the up titration of doses, as well as the need to refer to a specialist, as well as to consider fourth medication if blood pressure control remains elusive. So the main take home point from this particular manuscript is that the use of a stepwise approach to the introduction of a hypertension protocol could lead to improvements in blood pressure control as well as lead to improvements in outcomes in hypertension. Now, it should be a target that we try to establish persons on ideal medications with time, but recognize that this may take several months to even a year to achieve. So those are two of the manuscripts that we identify that we think are relevant to the discourse that we're having at this time. Um, the first manuscript speaking about the COVID-19 pandemic and ways we can use the lessons for that pandemic to improve outcomes in hypertension. And secondly, 
using one strategy of improving the pharmacologic management of hypertension, um, using a stepwise approach to algorithm development and improving the quality of the drugs that we use in the management of hypertension, which as mentioned is particularly um, relevant in the current discourse that we're having. All right, I'll thank you for your attention and I'll hand it back over to Dr. DePetty. Uh, Jumario, thank you very, very much for a very succinct uh, and review. We also have these two papers, of course, available uh, to the group today, and they are both open access uh, and they're, they're readily accessible. Dr. Dunas, I'd like to turn it back over to you now. I know we have a third uh, paper uh, that comes from PAHO and or your, how you want to move forward in terms of moderating. But again, we appreciate the time that you've given not only us as individuals, but this topic, uh, which is extraordinarily timely uh, and, and, and inappropriate. Thank you and thank you, Jamario. We enjoyed your presentation. Thank you very much. You always have a very timely contribution to the Barba to the Hearts program way back when you were in Barbados. We have done a lot of work together. So it was a pleasure to have you with us. And I'm glad that Professor DePetty invited you so that you could share your work with us. Now, we are reaching the end of our webinar, but I do want to remind you that we have some 400 people that are still connected. That's twice what we had when we started. And today's a Monday. But we have a lot of webinars on different topics. And so we said, OK, let's do this on Monday. But that is Zoom. And then on YouTube, we have others listening to this webinar live. And then something else that I have to say before we get into the last presentation that is going to be highly relevant is that all of this will be posted on HEART's web page. It will be HEART in Las Americas in the Americas. So this will be available to you. That means you can share the link with your colleagues that may have been too busy to join us today. Now, just recently, we heard something that was good news. And that was the update on the part of PAHO. It wants to support countries in terms of therapeutics, the treatments that are working for COVID-19. And one of the leaders of that effort is Dr. Ludo Ludovic Reves. He's going to give us a quick overview of the progress made in COVID-19 therapeutics. So thank you. And Ludovic, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Pedro. Can you hear me? Thank you, Pedro. Thank you again for inviting me. And also, I wanted to congratulate all of the colleagues that are working on HEARTS. I congratulate you on all the progress made, all of the things reported in the excellent presentations. Now, very quickly, I want to tell you about a systematic living review of interventions. This is something we have been looking at since April of this year. And this began by looking for studies that were in vitro. Back then, there weren't all that many case studies. And the objective of my presentation is we wanted to gather all of the evidence on therapeutic options, the different options where we have evidence coming from clinical trials, randomized, or some cases, if there are no RCTs, then we look at potential interventions that could be important, and also observational studies. So what we have been doing is we have been using methods that are, first of all, a quick systematic review using methods like Cochrane to identify those systematic reviews. And also, we're using the grade system. And it allows us to assess the quality of the evidence that we have. 
And then lastly, and of course we understand that there are other systematic reviews that are being published and there are different collaborations were part of some of them. So in this systematic review, we look at what is being done elsewhere and we validate our own review by looking at what is being done elsewhere. Now, there's something I wanted to tell you about. First of all, our search for studies is very comprehensive. We have joined forces with WHO right from the beginning of the pandemic. They put together a search engine that identifies all sorts of sources in different languages. And then second, there is another searcher that has 4,100 40, I'm sorry, 41 databases, preprints, preprints in different languages. And what we have seen is that this identifies studies almost immediately, studies that we want to focus on. Now, at the beginning of the pandemic, we initially tried to prioritize potential therapeutic options. And then we have added any randomized clinical trials. We're including that. So we really don't have any limit in terms of the interventions. If there is evidence, we incorporate those studies. Now, a second point that I wanted to underscore is how we weigh the evidence, because you realize that we're faced with a true infodemic hundreds of primary cases, case reports, series, clinical trials, randomized clinical trials. So we're using a grade system and that allows us to look at the design of the study. That allows us to understand the evidence better and also we look at observational studies. And for each study, something that we find in our review is that we look at several factors. We look at the bias risk. We look at inconsistencies. Also, we look at whether the evidence is direct or indirect. We look at accuracy. That has to do with the confidence interval and obviously the bias of the publication. So these are components, and I'm not going to get into details about the methodological aspects, but the whole idea is that in our review, what we present goes beyond just showing the results of a study or a confidence interval or saying, yes, this is significant or no, it is not. So we try to do a complete assessment. We use different analytical tools. And then based on that, we decide what we need to do next. Now, we do classify the level of quality of evidence. We say high, moderate, low, very low. And we look at if it is a randomized clinical tile, is it if it's an observational study. So we take that into account, but also we take into account these factors, the bias risk, consistency, et cetera. Now, what does all of this mean at the end of the day? When I have high quality evidence, I'm saying that it is very improbable that new studies are going to change confidence in the estimated result. Or if it's very low, any estimated result is very uncertain. So this is a scale, and this is a system used by grade. Now, regarding the methods, I'm not going to get into detail because of time limitations, but we do use all of the internationally recommended standards. And regarding the results, this is a summary table that you can see. 
you can see the results we have. So we have a list of all the interventions. And right now we have more than 125 randomized clinical trials for each of the interventions. And also we have observational studies. You can see the table and because of time limitations, I'm not going to get into that, but these are things we're also looking at. So here you can also see taking into account that this is a quick review. This is publication 11. That's the number of updates. So our focus is to do a systematic review with all of the different results or outcomes. We looked at the outcomes that we consider to be critical. They have to do with mortality, with intubation, adverse events, and also, if it's a matter of prophylaxis, there's a differentiation between symptomatic and non-symptomatic disease. So as you can see, this is a general overview of what we're doing in our review. And in green, that means that there is evidence and that that is either high quality, it's strong evidence, and there is a shading of the green too. And also we look at beneficial effect or not harmful effect that is in yellow. If the effect is harmful, it's in red. And if there's no evidence or no estimable effect, we use black and we use gray for uncertain effect. Something I wanted to point out on the screen is that there are a lot of interventions with clinical trials, but most of these publications do not talk about outcome. What they are, they are doing is they look at viral load or some other sort of outcome, but they're really not looking at mortality. They're not looking at the strong outcomes that we're interested in or the sample size is very small. So that's a problem. I'm not going to get into many details, but I do want to share this with you. When you go to the review, and I put the link in the chat if you want to copy it down, but you'll find tables, figures. Here we have a summary of the results, but the most important ones are for each intervention, we have a description of each of the RCTs. We have a bias risk evaluation, the quality of each study. We look at the different meta-analyses that can be done with those results. Plus, we also have the tables where we do a complete evaluation of the quality, as I already said. Plus, we put in information saying out of 1,000 people, what would the effect of this intervention be in terms of outcome, mortality, mechanical ventilation, symptom resolution, adverse events, etc. Now, these are some examples of some meta-analysis. This is prophylaxis with hydroxychloroquine, and you can see mortality rates. This is more prophylaxis with hydroxychloroquine. And this is a summary that comes towards the end. This is a summary where we look at a population made up of 1,000 patients. And we look at the real effect of these different outcomes. What would the effect be with this type of intervention on 1,000 people? So I'm not going to get into further detail, but that is what you would find in our publications. Now, we're publishing our systematic review every two or three weeks. And here, our overarching objective is to provide information to our member states, to the ministries, to the public in general. And that is why we issue it as a PAHO publication. We're not publishing it as a journal. 
because what this review does is look at methodological quality and it gives us basically information day by day. Every day we look at the studies that have been published and we immediately deliver results if we think that's appropriate, if it's necessary. And another thing is that as a result of the systematic reviews that we're doing, we come up with management guidelines for slight and moderate as well as critical patients. And these studies are prepared with grade. They are available on the PAHO webpage for patient management. So very quickly, that was what I wanted to share with you. And Pedro, I thank you very much for giving us this time. We know that the time is precious. I hope I didn't go through this too quickly, but I did want to show you the results and the methodology we are following to produce these publications. Thank you very much, Ludovic, for being with us. One good thing about the webinar is that it highlights what we're doing and that way, our audience, if interested, knows where to find things. You can find the documents being produced by PAHO, documents like the one mentioned by Ludovic, or you can go to the HEARTS webpage where you will have a recording of this webinar. And there too, you will find all of the materials that we shared with you today. Now we are coming to the end of our webinar, but I do want to ask all of our speakers to turn on their cameras. We don't have all that much time left, but first I wanted to thank our donors, our partners, especially our colleagues from CDC and from Resolve to Save Life. I thank them for their contributions. I hope that we will continue to facilitate access to the publications of heart. Also the people from CMU and H and also hearts in Washington. And also I greet our heart community, the heart member countries. And as we always say, please do continue to provide us with information. Send us your questions. What do you want us to do in HEART? What should we be working on? What would you like us to cover in the webinar? We have had 400 people watching us. So that's just a number, but we do continue to move ahead. So uh, I want to thank our main speakers today because they really brought cardiovascular and COVID-19 to us, putting it right in the middle of the picture. I'm going to begin with uh, Dr. Kenneth in Barbados. Kenneth, I don't know about that storm that's in the Caribbean. I think there's a storm and we are all very worried about that. But what could you say to the countries? What message would you want to convey to the member countries? So I would want to say, Pedro, that there is another storm and it's an NCD storm and it's currently in our midst every day. It's here. And although we're facing a pandemic, which is potentially uh, with its surges and its, its peaks and troughs, we have to kind of realize that the, the baseline climate is not stability. It's a brewing pandemic of NCDs and we need to take action. Hearts offers an opportunity to do this in a very structured way. And it's propelled even more by COVID-19 where the requirements of health systems are being shifted to COVID-19 and therefore we need to do things better. As WHO has said, we need to build back better using innovation. Excellent. That is the storm that's coming through the Caribbean and it's going up saying NCDs and hypertension is there. COVID, fortunately, we know more about COVID today. We know lots that we didn't know when the pandemic started, but we're still very far from having a solution. And we need to move gradually towards new measures. I'd like to ask Professor uh, Daniel Lackland, what advice you have for us? What should our next steps be? What would you tell the community of Hearts Countries? 
Uh, Pedro, I'd like to follow up on, on you and Ken and on, and on Don there too. The first thing is with the COVID-19, we're learning every day, as you said very well, we're learning new lessons and we're learning how to treat. With hypertension, the evidence is here. We have solid evidence that everyone knows how to do. So we're ready to implement. We're not waiting for anything. We're, we're ready to go and, to, and can be very, very successful. The new pieces that things like hearts and the group has said here today is just kind of a new way of implementing the evidence that we knew and implementation science, I guess is where we are now, where you have the healthcare team that's, that's, that's being a part. And, and then also the, the, the patients are being a part now too. So everybody can be in on this and can make a tremendous difference. We know it can make a difference. And very to go to our earlier statement, it is cost-effective. This might be the most cost-effective thing that we could possibly do and, and bringing it through. And this is a document for now implementation to address which, not necessarily the COVID-19 pandemic, but certainly the pandemic of uh, hypertension and hypertension out, uh, outcomes. That was an excellent thought. And we have the storm, we have a, another hurricane coming, which uh, is COVID. And we also have our chronic uh, pandemic of chronic diseases and hypertension. And this is really serious. There is a very large hurricane headed towards Central America once again. So uh, we also have a weather phenomenon. And all of this means that the situation is urgent and that health services for many people are going to be worse off. So I would like to finally give the floor to Professor DePetty to help us end with the message of optimism. Don always does this. He always finds a way. We may see major challenges, but he finds a way to address them. Dr. DePetty, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Pedro. Thank you for allowing me to be involved uh, and to, uh, to continue to, to be involved in the HEARTS program. I guess we've come full circle in this webinar. We've started with the very first slide uh, in the overview presentation of the COVID-19 and pandemic and the NCD, a chronic pandemic, if you will, or crisis, if you will, forming the perfect storm. And we've ended discussing the perfect storm uh, as Dr. Connell and Dr. Lackland has suggested. And, and I'm referring to the, hopefully everybody will be safe with the, with the storm in the Gulf, but of course I'm referring to COVID-19 and NCD, uh, they are, they're devastating interrelationship. But I think that out, of, out of, of challenges comes opportunities. So let's turn this around. Let's turn it around into a moment of opportunity. There's been a lot written on change theory. We've talked about this actually in some of the hearts uh, uh, sessions when we've visited countries. Uh, and the, the change theory starts with a burning platform. If we don't have a burning platform, systems just do not change. Health systems don't change, individuals don't change. There is no question we have a burning platform. The burning platform is not only the COVID-19 acute pandemic, but the chronic NCD a, a pandemic, which is upon us. And that burning platform, I think, I, I'll say it again, the United States has been at this for maybe four or five decades. And for the Surgeon General to come out with a specific report, which time is money and, and energy is energy, and to put his name behind a call to action for hypertension just a month ago, I think speaks volumes for the, for the, regarding the burning platform that we have. And again, use it. Let's use, uh, let's use the United States' experience where we had success and now we seem to be slipping. On the other hand, the hearts countries, the 12 cohorts already that have already implemented uh, the, the HEARTS program has given me tremendous, tremendous hope and, and enthusiasm. And I welcome the other three uh, HEARTS countries, the fifth cohorts, uh, if you will. And I look forward to hopefully someday, sometime, doing all this in person again. We can do it. We've done it already. Let's build upon our success.
that's an excellent message. As I said, uh, Professor De Petty always helps us end on a positive note. And I think you're really tapping into a very important uh, topic. We have 12 uh, countries applying heart. We have new countries, and we're going to keep increasing it. It's very important for this message about hypertension to come in loud and clear, and this be our foremost tool for addressing the new challenges in this new stage. Not We're still in the COVID stage, but also for the post-COVID, I want to thank Gloria, Cynthia, and Jenny, and all of our colleagues, and uh, Ludovic, uh, please put your uh, cameras on so we can take a final uh, closing photo of our participants so we can greet our audience there. There are many people uh, watching this webinar, supporting, providing ideas, knowledge. I think it is very important for us to do this. So a very good day to all of you. And thank you very much for your attention to our colleagues from CMU once again for your tremendous technical support for this webinar. And I thank our colleagues in the countries. So without further ado, and also I thank our interpreters who are doing a great yes. job as well, trying to understand all of us. And so uh, this allows us to understand our each other's languages from wherever we are. But so we're gonna uh, have our end message is Hearts in the Americas. That's our website. That's where you have all of the material we're making available to you. I thank all of the excellent speakers for their kindness and support and contributions. And a very good day to all of you. We'll see you next time. And we say goodbye to all of our audience and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, thank you.